All right, everyone, this is a continuation of last class's notes on the Jazz Age. We're going to be looking at more of the social revolution that comes as a result of the new morality, as well as some of those changes that come at, um, resulting from World War I. I also want to apologize ahead of time if you hear any weird things in the background. That will be my dog going to town on a chew stick, and he gets a little excited about it. So if you hear weird growling noises in the back, that's my dog. And our first topic is going to be the movies. The movie houses of the 1920s were really quite elaborate and quite um, opulent in a lot of ways, very similar to what you would see at the Pantages or even at the Fox Theater in Riverside. Um, you had very nice cushioned seats. You had air conditioning, which you couldn't really find in most public places as well as you are going to be able to see some really exciting films. Silent films have been around for a while at this point, 15, 20 years, but up to this point, they had been short. They had been um, very brief kind of snippet storylines. Now we're getting longer films with more elaborate storylines and more exciting um, you know, action adventures and things like this. The movies are going to inspire the fashion and also the behavior of America's youth, very similar to what it does today. The people that you saw on screen, you wanted to look like them. You wanted to act like them because you kind of wanted to be them. And so that's why you're going to see the young people of the time start to emulate them and dress like them. Um, but there was a lot of concern over the popularity of uh, movies, and that was because they were seen as potentially morally dangerous. First of all, a lot of the silent film stars were not from the United States. They're going to be coming from foreign countries, and there was a fear that these foreigners were stealing the hearts of America's youth and could potentially get them to um, support or even marry people outside of their race. Also, there was a fear of it promoting immorality. In the movies, you see a lot of um, men and women in kind of sensuous locations and sensuous situations that was going against the very puritanistic morality that existed at the time. And they didn't want their children to be watching these movies and getting ideas of things they probably shouldn't be thinking about. And just as with today, there were some serious movie stars at the time. So we're going to start off on the left-hand side with Rudolph Valentino. Rudolph Valentino was generally known as the heartthrob of the 1920s. He was the one that all the girls just fell in love with. He was dashing. He was um, debonair. He was kind of brooding a little bit. And he always played the romantic hero. He always played kind of these, um, these rugged, masculine characters that women just fell over themselves to be with. The one we see in the middle, that's Douglas Fairbanks. And Douglas Fairbanks was um, the one that all of the girls loved and all of the one that all of the men wanted to be like because he was always in all the action movies. He was in all of the movies that are... Um, you know, where you'd have the, the rugged heroes. Um, he was in the first, um, uh, the first uh, Robin Hood movie, and he played Robin Hood. He was in a whole bunch of pirate movies and movies where he was, you know, this exciting adventurer, you know, and, and that was exciting for men to watch, but also women really liked him just because of, you know, how handsome he was and, you know, how masculine he seemed to be. And then on the right-hand side, one you guys are all familiar with, um, is going to be Charlie Chaplin, and he is going to be the funny man. Um, he's going to be the one that makes everybody laugh, and it is because of this character known as the tramp. And tramping, uh, tramp meaning that he's homeless. Um, that's why this, you know, jacket's a little too small and his pants are a little too big, and the character of the tramp was wildly popular all throughout the 1920s into the 1930s and has become an iconic character that is still emulated even today. When it comes to the ladies, we have our starlets. 
On the left-hand side, we have Darling Mary Pickford. Mary Pickford was a film star pretty much from the turn of the century, um, from about 1905 into the early 1920s. And she always played this very innocent, very sweet little ingenue, um, the damsel in distress who always has to be saved. If you ever think of those melodramas where you have, you know, the... Uh, you know, the damsel in distress being tied to the railroad tracks and the dastardly villain twisting his mustache, you know, that would be Mary Pickford. She was the one that was tied to the railroad tracks every time. On the far right-hand side, we have Marion Davies. Marion Davies is known for um, being a little bit more, um, more substantive than Mary Pickford's roles. Um, but at the same time, she was still very sweet and she was still very nice and very safe in the eyes of most moviegoers. She never really had too many roles that were um, dangerous or uh, were maybe morally ambiguous. The one that that does identify with is the one in the middle, Clara Bow. Clara Bow was the ultimate flapper on screen. She actually, in a lot of ways, defined what flappers looked like and how they behaved by the characters that she played on screen and also her behaviors off screen. Um, she dyed her hair a dark henna red and wore lots and lots of dark eye makeup and lipstick. Um, she showed a lot of skin and she was um, fun loving and playful in her movies and she was always the one that the men wanted. And so she becomes known as the very first it girl. And you might have heard this phrase before. Um, an it girl uh, is someone who is gaining a lot of attention and is kind of the, the person of the moment, the one that everyone wants to have in their movies or have on their shows. So, um, you know, today's it girl would be someone like Jennifer Lawrence, where she seems to be in virtually everything that comes out. Um, but the reason that she is the first It Girl is because of the movie that she was in titled It. And no, I'm not talking about the creepy clown movie. Um, in this movie, uh, it was a very short version of the movie, you have this wealthy young man who has just inherited his father's department store chain. And he is... Um, working a lot and overtired and overstressed and his buddy comes in and tells him, man, you just need to take a day off. You need to, you need to find yourself a girl to spend some time with instead of spending so much time at work. And the guy says, yeah, but you know, I'm really bored with a lot of the rich women that I'm surrounded with and they're so uptight and they're so boring. And his buddy says, you know what you need? You need one of these girls. And he gives them this magazine article that's talking about a girl who has it. This indescribable quality that makes these women irresistible. Um, but what they're really describing is sex appeal. And that had never been shown in movies before. You know, you look at Mary and Davies, you look at Mary Pickford, the two biggest stars of the time, and they were always so sweet and so innocent and so pure that when you see a woman that's showing skin and being flirty, they had never seen that before. And so Clara Bow, her characters really gave a lot of women the approval and the opportunity to be flirty. And that's going to be a huge part of the, the flapper personality. But soon, all of that would change. Everything would change with the coming out of this movie, The Jazz Singer. What makes this movie so significant is the fact that it is the world's very first talky movie. And what I mean by talky is that this is a movie that actually has sound in it. It is a movie that you can hear them speaking and it is not being done with, you know, kind of huge um, overacting with, you know, short little bits of speech and dialogue being shown on slides intermittently. 
It's like a movie that you and I watched today. And um, when this came out, there were some very diverse reactions. Um, some people immediately thought that this was a hoax, like that there was no possibility that this kind of technology could exist. There were a lot of people that thought that it was merely a fad. It's going to pass because people like the, the drama and the theatricality that comes from a silent film. Nobody's going to want to listen to a bunch of people drone on for, you know, hours at a time. But that was actually what they had kind of counted on uh, when they made this movie. When Warner Brothers made The Jazz Singer, they brought in an already well-known individual. They brought in Al Jolson. He was already a well-known jazz uh, jazz singer. He was already well-known within the vaudeville scene, traveling around the world um, or traveling around the country, um, doing these short, you know, little shows. Um, and when he made this movie, he was already well-known and they were kind of counting on people coming to see the movie because they already liked him as a singer. It it would be as if like Bruno Mars just won the Grammy and now he's going to go into a movie. So of course you're going to go see the movie because you like his music. Um, now the jazz singer, although it's, it's very, you know, important because it's the very first talkie movie, you never see it on television. And that's because of what you see on the right hand side here. Uh, these two are the same person. This is actually um, Al Jolson performing in the movie a role that he played in vaudeville a lot and this was a common role within vaudeville of a black-faced actor so you have a white actor in blackface playing this um this happy-go-lucky kind of not so bright african-american character that many times was um uh was kind of in a servant's position this is actually where the term Jim Crow originally comes from because that was a popular vaudeville character that was already being played. Um, so this is why you don't see this movie on television. Um, it's because today it's considered to be ethnically insensitive. However, this has a huge impact over time uh, on the movie industry. Not only are audiences loving the fact that they can hear their their you know these characters and that they get much more out of the storyline with dialogue and they can have music that goes along with it but the impact is also going to be on those that had been the silent film stars people like Rudolph Valentino he wasn't American he was originally from Italy and could barely speak English and had such a incredibly thick accent, you could barely understand him. So he's not going to get roles once the talkies become common. And people like Clara Bow, as beautiful as she was, as seductive as she was, as popular as she was, she came from Brooklyn. And she had a thick Brooklyn accent. And people did not like hearing that grating Brooklyn accent come out of that beautiful face. And very quickly after the talkies began to become the common norm, Claire Bow kind of disappeared. Sports are also going to be a huge part of America's excitement during the 1920s. Um, we're going to start off with the one at the bottom. This is Jack Dempsey. Jack Dempsey was the heavyweight champion of the world and had for many, many, many years the, um, excuse me, the greatest title of um, basically longest held heavyweight title. Um, and he was kind of a little bit of a rags to riches story and Americans just really enjoyed him. Why this is kind of significant in the 20s is because prior to this time, Boxing was seen as a low-class sport. Um, I mean, if you think about it, they're fist fighting. I mean, that's not, that's not really something that, you know, the genteel upper classes would really associate themselves with. But as time is going to go on in the 1920s, the boxing industry is going to try and attract 
bigger audiences and attract the wealthier audiences. So they start holding boxing matches in grander, in more um, sophisticated environments. And they start having them where you have private seating and boxes, where you can have food and drinks served. And the upper classes begin to be interested in boxing. And it does start to change the entire, um, the entire sport. Part of also what gets the genteel upper classes to be interested in this um, is that they changed a lot of the rules of the sport to become a little less like street fighting and more into an actual organized sport. Um, you know, the, the rule of, you know, not hitting below the belt comes around at this time. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a point system and all of that created so that it is more of an actual organized sport and not just two guys beating the crap out of each other. So it becomes very popular during the 1920s and would continue to be so um, from this point onward. Next, we're going to look at the right and we're going to look at the beginning of the NFL. Football has been around for a long time. Um, football originates from soccer, which um, would then be um, blended in with uh, the game of rugby. And college football had been played for years and years and years and years. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was a college football player. And football had been an important part of the college experience, especially for the Ivy Leagues. It was a way for young men to prove their masculinity in times when the United States was not at war. It was a way to be a man and be a hero without going to war. But you were supposed to stop playing once you left college because you were expected to grow up and get a job and become an adult. So men that continued to play football after college were looked down upon, kind of like, dude, grow up, figure out your life. Don't, you know, don't keep playing a children's sport. And this is, you know, kind of the attitude in the beginning of the 1920s. So um, we did create, prior to the 1920s, the first national football leagues. Um, I'm lucky enough to have some connection to this. My great-grandfather was actually... Um, the general manager of one of the very first professional football teams that came out of Shelby, Ohio, um, which is kind of out by Cincinnati. And um, one of the people that he hired was a young uh, college-age young man by the name of Branch Rickey, who would later go on to um, hire Jackie Robinson to the Dodgers in the 1940s. Um, but like I said, when it first started out, it was not really considered a, a professional sport. It was something that was looked down upon. In the 1920s, the owners of the various teams decided that they, like boxing, wanted to make this a more acceptable sport to the masses. And so they changed a lot of the rules. Number one, you couldn't switch teams. You signed with a team and you stuck with the team because prior to this, they would play for multiple teams within a given week. Um, two, that they were expected to act like gentlemen on and off the field. And in many cases, were actually um, required to take basically gentlemen's classes or, or um, manners classes and how to behave. Um, another rule that was created was that they had to wear helmets. That wasn't a rule before. So you had a lot of people getting injured and even being killed on the field prior to the changes in some of these rules. And during the 1920s, football is going to become an increasingly more and more and more popular sport within the United States. But no sport at that time was going to be able to top America's pastime, baseball. And the late 20s through the 1930s is going to be some of the greatest times in, in Major League Baseball. This is going to be the era where we are introduced to a heavy hitter by the name of Babe Ruth. And um, Babe Ruth was really the first 
probably household name when it came to sports. Um, there were a lot of people who in various sports had been popular, but Babe Ruth was a name that everybody knew. Everyone from children who followed him listening to the radio to grandmas who just read about him in the newspaper. Everybody knew Babe Ruth. And baseball would really solidify itself as America's pastime during the 1920s. Another event that's going to have a huge impact on our uh, social consciousness and on our country is going to be Prohibition, the Great Experiment. And we're going to be looking at exactly how and why that fails so epically during this time. The 19th century temperance movement had been a big cause of prohibition. It had gotten people into the idea of questioning whether alcohol should be a part of our country's society. Um, That it was, in many cases, what caused poverty or what was um, a part of poverty. It was... Um, very much involved in crime and violence. And so people saw it as a way to um, begin to eliminate those social ills. You add into that anti-German prejudice that comes during World War I that is going to negatively affect the predominantly German beer brewers of the time. You know, Budweiser, Schlitz, Pabst, they're all German. So we're not going to support the Germans in war, and we're not going to support German beer brewers here at home. But the one thing that really was the nail in the coffin for those that wanted to keep alcohol was the 16th Amendment. The 16th Amendment created the graduated income tax. And when that passed, the federal government no longer relied on the tax money brought in by the beer brewers and by the distillers to run the government anymore. They were bringing in money based on people's income. And that was going to um, allow them the, the monetary ability to pass prohibition. But even though prohibition is going to be passed, it doesn't mean that everybody agrees with it. Um, in fact, um, even as the, the debate over prohibition was beginning, America became quickly divided in wets versus dries. Wet meaning that you supported alcohol, dry meaning you supported prohibition. And um, wet versus dry was very much regional. Those that were wet were usually in um, major cities and often on the coastlines. The dries were often from rural areas and also a lot more religious. But prohibition would be passed. Um, despite the arguments uh, by the wets that it was, you know, not going to solve any problems and that it was, um, you know, going against American ideals of freedom and freedom of choice, um, this was hailed as a victory for health and for moral values and for Christian values. And this was supposedly going to save America. And they couldn't have been more wrong. Just because you make a law to outlaw alcohol doesn't mean people are necessarily going to follow it. Um, And people are not going to suddenly go, oh, hey, we can't have alcohol? Cool, I'm fine with that. They're going to find alcohol, and it's going to become almost even more desirable now that you're being told that you can't have it. So there's going to be a variety of ways that people are going to be able to access alcohol. One of these is through moonshining. Um, moonshining has been a practice in America since America. Um, moonshining is the illegal distillation of alcohol for sale. So you can brew beer for your own personal purpose. You can make wine for your own personal purpose. And that's not illegal. But if you make a lot of it and you intend to sell it, and you don't have a license, that's moonshining. And like I said, this has been a practice in the United States since people got here. Um, And this becomes more and more prevalent during the 1920s and 30s during Prohibition. And it's called moonshining because you generally were doing this by the light of the moon, because you were doing it at night to avoid detection by the authorities. So what you have here in this particular picture are a bunch of people out in the woods who are distilling liquor. 
and more than likely they are distilling a very high alcohol content grain liquor that is simply called moonshine. Um, and moonshine is popular at this time because it's a really big bang for your buck. It's almost 100% ethyl alcohol. It is nearly rubbing alcohol. So it doesn't take a lot to get you drunk. Um, and since people weren't going to be able to get regular access to alcohol, this was going to be an easy way for them to get drunk and to enjoy themselves without having to continually go buy more liquor. Um, moonshining is generally done in these things right here. These are known as stills. And um, they are going to use whatever grains are available. Um, corn, wheat, oats, rye, even potatoes um, can be used to make moonshine. And... Um, you basically used whatever was kind of the local grain and whatever was, um, whatever was available. Um, they had to be a little bit careful because obviously, you know, you'll draw a lot of attention if you go around and you start buying huge amounts of corn and things like this. So these guys usually either raise their own, uh, grains or they would have a deal with somebody that those people would give them part of their crops and they would give them in return some of the moonshine. Now, the problem with this is, is that you do have to distill this. You got to run it through a filtering system like you do a Brita filter. So they needed to Brita filter this alcohol. Normally, you would use things like charcoal, um, but those were being watched closely by the police because the police wanted to know who's doing illegal moonshining. So they started to distill it using other things that they could find easily that they could use as a filter. So sometimes they would use steel wool, which um, using steel with alcohol breaks down the steel and now you're actually drinking tiny flecks of steel wool when you're drinking this stuff, which rips up your throat and rips up your intestines and can cause internal bleeding. They would filter it through cat litter. They would filter it through even rat poison in some instances. These things are going to make people sick and it was many times causing people to become so ill that they might actually go blind or even die. Um, moonshine blindness was actually a relatively common occurrence because of the nasty chemicals that people were using to filter the moonshine. But they were desperate to get booze because they were, were not able to get it otherwise. How it gets from the moonshiners to people's homes is by bootleggers. Bootleggers get their nickname from actually pre-Civil War era. Um, in Maine, they had passed a prohibition law where they outlawed alcohol completely. And there was a group of people that were sneaking alcohol to other folks. And there would be men who would offer you a swig of alcohol um, from a flask hidden in their boot um, for, you know, a small amount of change. And so these men became known as bootleggers. Well, then the idea just kind of stuck of anyone who is transporting or distributing illegal alcohol is known as a bootlegger. And man, did they get super inventive. Um, you can see in this picture here, it looks like this is a lumber truck, but in reality, it had a false back where they could actually hide a whole cart of liquor in. Brilliant. Um, down here in this picture, this is all the alcohol found in this automobile that was pulled over crossing the border back in from Canada. Um, it's hard to imagine where they hid all of that, but they were really smart about it. Um, they would create false bottoms underneath um, underneath the, the seats of the car. Or they would create a false gas tank that they could fill with alcohol and have the real gas tank located somewhere else in the automobile. Or they would, um, what looked like the spare tire back here, would actually be filled with booze. They got really smart about it. Um, they were getting a lot of their alcohol from moonshiners. And as I've said earlier, they got a lot of this from Canada. 
Canada had actually already passed a prohibition law years before we did. But as they had an issue with their own moonshiners, they eventually changed their law, especially after America passed its prohibition law. And the law in Canada changed to that they could not create or distribute alcohol unless it was for export. And so Canadians were providing a lot of America's liquor as well. So now think about it. If you're a police officer and you keep seeing these cars go up and down and up and down across the Canadian border, seems a little fishy. You might want to start investigating. And so the people that were the bootleggers were realizing that they needed to find a way to outsmart and outrun the cops. So they began to soup up their cars and began to find ways to, um, you know, to make them faster to outrun the police. And as a lot of these people would tend to do, they would start to brag to each other about how their car was faster than the other guy's car. And, oh, you should see this, you know, this cop that I left in my dust the other day. And so they start actually racing each other to prove whose car has been souped up the most and and is the fastest and is the best. And eventually this will develop this this kind of uh, set of stock cars that have been refurbished and have been changed are going to actually become the background for NASCAR. And it's the NASCAR that we know today. And it is um, the National Association of Stock Car Racing. So this is actually directly related and directly the cause or caused by bootlegging of the 1920s. Speakeasies are where people would go in order to purchase this illegal alcohol. And um, these were located all over the United States, but especially in the major cities. And they could be located virtually anywhere. You would find these places in back rooms of restaurants. You would find them in basements. You would find them behind false walls in places ranging from everything from a dry cleaners to a library to even a back room in a police station. Some of these places are incredibly elaborate and incredibly, um, they're very fancy. As you can see here in this top picture, they're serving champagne, they're serving fancy cocktails. The people are dressed to the nines, women wearing fur coats and diamonds, men wearing tuxedos with tails. There would be bands, there would be dancing. Some of these were incredibly posh and elite. But most of them, most of them were very small and most of them were very quiet. Places that you see in the bottom here where they might have only space for a couple dozen people. Um, some of them were really low key and they would be basically looking almost like somebody's kitchen here. Um, but regardless, this was a place that people could go and get a drink and enjoy themselves and have a good time. Um, there would be oftentimes a code word or a special knock that you had to know in order to get access to the speakeasy because obviously they don't want the cops to be able to get in. Um, and so uh, there was you know, a, a saying that um, the most common phrase in America was go up two flights, knock three times and ask for Joe. And that was kind of a, a way of explaining the proliferation of code words um, to get access to these speakeasies. Now, why they're called speakeasies is because if you get a large group of people drinking alcohol over an extended period of time, they tend to get extremely loud. And so the people that own the place needed to make sure that the cops didn't get wise. And so they needed to keep the people quiet. And so they would tell them to speak easy, speak softly, quietly. And so that's where the name comes from, speakeasy. Speakeasies were really impressive in the way that they were able to be hidden. Um, some of these you would actually have to, for example, go into a um, what looked like a phone booth and then speak to an operator on the other line to be able to get access to a hidden panel within the 
phone booths that would actually lead into a restaurant or a speakeasy bar. Um, you would see this kind of thing where it would be fronted by a law office that wasn't actually a law office, but it looked like a law office. Um, seeing, you know, quote unquote clients come in at all hours of the day and night. So although prohibition was supposed to eliminate sin and vice and crime and violence, it, it pretty much ends up doing the exact opposite. First of all, because people still want liquor, it's going to create the emergence of a very cutthroat black market. There are going to be various gangs that are going to try and maintain their quote-unquote territory. They are going to fight for control of different areas, different neighborhoods, different cities. Um, and this is now going to become the mainstay of organized crime. Organized crime had been relatively low-key up to this point. You had had an original kind of um, mob in America, that was the Irish mob from kind of the pre-Civil War days, that sort of had some control and you had had other mobs come in during the meantime. You had a Polish mob and you had an Italian mob and a Jewish mob and a lot of other organized crime families. But again, the, they were relatively small in scale and weren't necessarily involved that much in um, larger citywide schemes until Prohibition. Organized crime will take over major cities, including Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and they are going to be extremely violent in keeping control of their territory. And these individuals are going to become household names just as Babe Ruth and Jack Dempsey were. Um, because they end up with these really colorful nicknames, uh, names like um, uh, Pretty Boy Floyd or Babyface Nelson, uh, of Legs Diamond and Jack Ruby, even Lucky Luciano. One of the more well-known ones is going to be here, and that is John Dillinger, who will really rise to kind of his greatest fame in the late 20s and early 1930s. But of course... If we're going to talk about any organized crime member, we have to talk about this one. And this is going to be Al Capone. Al Capone is the ultimate gangster, um, but definitely not at the beginning. Now, he is going to be the leader of the Southside Gang in Chicago. Um, he rises up through the ranks from basically a, a low-level soldier enforcer to then becoming the boss of the largest and most violent and influential crime family in America. So you can see that the goal of making prohibition a goal for, um, you know, the ending of violence and crime and sin and vice is an absolute and utter failure. Um, Al Capone is kind of a great example of that. First of all, um, his nickname is Scarface because he actually had a large scar across the side of his face because of an altercation that he had as a young man. And um, he is going to become so big in the news, not only for his epic um, control over bootlegging in Chicago and his role within the organized crime world, but also in many cases for the philanthropy that he did for the poor and, um, and struggling in Chicago. He actually opens up the first food bank, or uh, excuse me, uh, first soup kitchen in Chicago during the Great Depression. Like he actually did a lot of really good things, um, even though he was kind of a, you know, awful individual in other ways. But he becomes so well-known in the news that movies decide to make a film about him, and they name it Scarface. Um, the original Scarface, done in 1932, was supposed to basically tell the story of Al Capone's life. And as you might guess, he really liked this movie. And because of it, he wants to be able to watch it whenever he wants to. And so he has the very first movie theater 
personal home movie theater built in his house in Chicago. And he had one of the only copies of that film after it was released into the theaters. So he had a lot of sway and a lot of power because of the money and influence that he had in Chicago. We know that he was involved in so much. We knew at the time that he was responsible for robberies and for, um, you know, for violence and attacks and also murders, and yet nothing could ever be pinned on him. And the most notorious of all these will be the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre occurred on Valentine's Day. Um, Capone was getting really tired of having to compete with all of the other gangs, um, with the Irish gang, with the, with the Jewish gang, with the Polish gangs, etc. And so he called up the Jewish gang and he says, look, I'm really tired of having to compete against all of you. So here's the deal I'm going to make you. We will stop competing. I'll let you have this small area of town and that's going to be your area. And you will then, in turn, have my protection from anyone else who tries to horn in. But you can't try and take any more of my territory. And the Jewish gang was kind of considering this. And, and they were like, well, that sounds good. But, you know, we're always being threatened by the Irish gang. And he says, that's my next part. I'm tired of dealing with them as well. And the Irish gang was honestly the group that he hated the most. And um, it was led by a man by the name of Bugs Moran. And so he says to the Jewish gang, just help me get rid of the Irish gang and we'll be good. That'll be our deal. And so the Jewish gang goes ahead and asks for the Irish gang to come work with them so that they don't have to deal with Capone anymore. And they argue, you know, hey, we're tired of having to, you know, to always look over our shoulder with Capone and we don't want to have to deal with him. So if the two of them would go in together, that they would be more powerful and be able to defeat Al Capone. Now, the Irish gang is a little bit wary about this, so they want to see an act of, you know, good faith. And so the Jewish gang says, look, we're going to be getting in a shipment of stuff from, from Canada. If you want to come in, test it, we'll let you have some of it for free as a sign of good faith. So they go down to this warehouse and they're going to be testing it out. And the ship com shipment comes in and they're looking at the booze. And then suddenly out of nowhere, boo, woo, you've got these police sirens going off and lights and them saying, all right, gentlemen, up against the wall. And so the men realize, oh, this is a raid, and it's not the first time that they've been raided by the cops. And so they're getting ready to, you know, go up against the wall and, you know, assume the position. And out of nowhere, brrr, machine guns go off, killing all of these men. And they weren't cops at all. They were Capone's men. And the thing is, Everybody knows they're Capone's men. But Capone was conveniently at a dinner with the city mayor that night, making sure that he had a very obvious alibi, as well as showing his connection to the powerful mayor of Chicago. And so this was one of the many ways where he was able to get out of responsibility for a crime that he definitely was responsible for. So how do we end up eventually getting Al Capone? It's really almost anticlimactic, actually. Al Capone, his official job title was furniture dealer. That was what was on his business cards. And that's what he put on for his taxes for the IRS. But the IRS had some questions because... He was a furniture dealer, and he was claiming that as a furniture dealer, he only made this amount of money, and yet he was able to afford so much more stuff. And so the IRS agent felt that there is something a bit of a miss here. And so they do some more investigation, and they were able to arrest Al Capone for tax evasion. So they couldn't get him on murder, but they could get him for withholding his taxes from Uncle Sam. 
Our last topic here is going to be on the Harlem Renaissance, a rebirth of African-American culture in America. As I said, this is a rebirth of African-American culture where they were trying to illustrate to not only themselves and their community, but also to the broader American community around them, the struggles as well as the contributions of African-Americans, showing the mainstream American citizen what their lives were really like. And there were vast changes to literature, to art, to music, to dance, to culture, Pretty much every aspect of social culture is going to be affected by the Harlem Renaissance. This was caused by two things. One, by World War I, where African Americans, not necessarily always serving in the United States Army, but had served valiantly during World War I. And they knew their importance, they knew their bravery, and they were proud of that. And that pride does begin to bleed over into their lifestyle here at home. But probably the greater impact is going to be the Great Migration. When African Americans moved from the South to the industrial cities of the North during the war in order to take on the wartime factory jobs, they are going to start to congregate in very dense communities. Um, Single communities within Chicago, within Detroit, and within New York, specifically Harlem. And when you have these people living in very close quarters nearby each other, they start to share their culture and they start to celebrate their culture more. And quickly that is going to expand beyond the borders of Harlem and around the entire United States. One person who celebrated black culture Um, was actually not an American. Um, He was a Jamaican, and his name is Marcus Garvey, and he promoted something called Negro nationalism, Um, this idea that African Americans should be proud of their culture and should not try to emulate white culture, that they should um, want to support their own background, their own history, and their own people. And he created the Universal Negro Improvement Association to do this, This group promoted black separatism. He believed that the United States hated African Americans so much that they would never be accepted into mainstream society. So if they don't like us, then why are we staying here? Let's go back home to Africa where everybody's like us, where our culture is not different, where we don't look different from anybody else. But this idea doesn't become really all that popular because most African Americans have never been to Africa. It isn't home to them. America is home to them. So there is a lot of people that like the idea of supporting black culture, but they don't necessarily want to go as far as to move to a different continent to do so. He also is going to create a shipping line that is solely run by and for African Americans, known as the Black Star Line. This was a play on the White Star Line, which was the um, manufacturing company that had built the Titanic and other major cruise liners of the time. And he got a lot of investors for this. A lot of people were supportive of the idea of a shipping company that was run by and solely for African Americans. However, It didn't really exist. Marcus Garvey had actually gotten a lot of investors, but the Black Star Line never actually got off the ground. And so he eventually was imprisoned and deported for mail fraud for basically stealing all these people's money. And that did put kind of a negative twist on the idea of Negro nationalism. But the Harlem Renaissance does end up being able to surpass this uh, setback. As with the art of the time, the literature of the Harlem Renaissance also promotes the struggles and contributions of African Americans. A great example of this are the writings by Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston's most famous book is Their Eyes Were Watching God. 
this was a absolutely heart-wrenching story of um, a woman named Janie who has an incredibly difficult life. She is um, extremely poor. She has a series of abusive relationships. She has a series of very upsetting um, miscarriages and struggles to get pregnant and have children. And yet, at the same time, she is a pillar of her society, that she is an incredibly important part of her community. And people turn to her in times of sickness and need. And the idea is from from Zora Neale Hurston that one, African-American stories didn't have to focus on white suppression. It could focus on the problems that did affect them as a culture about unemployment and problems of, you know, family problems that everybody faces. And as also, she was trying to show that African Americans were extremely strong and that they were important members of their society and that although they may not have much monetarily, they were still rich in many other ways. And so she is an excellent example of someone who promotes the ideals of the Harlem Renaissance. This gentleman right here is Langston Hughes. And the quotation here, he says, Traditionally, poets are lyric historians. From the days of the bards and the troubadours, the songs of the poets have been not only songs, but often records of the most moving events, the deepest thoughts, and the most profound emotional currents of their times. To understand Africa today, it is wise to listen to what its poets say those who put their songs down on paper, as well as those who only speak or sing them. And he does a great job of illustrating through poetry the struggles of African Americans and the things that they are hoping for in the future. Langston Hughes's most well-known poem is A Dream Deferred. And in this, the dream that he is referring to is the American dream. Now, to defer something means to put it off, to push it off until later. And usually that means that you're not doing it because you want to, but because you have no other choice. So he asks, what happens to a dream deferred? What happens when African Americans are told that they cannot achieve the American dream, that they have to put it off? that they have to continue to wait for it? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? What he's explaining here is the various ways that African Americans could respond to having to put off the American dream. Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Meaning, does it shrivel up? Does it become nothing? Does it eventually evaporate and become nothing? There is no American dream for them. Or does it fester like a sword? Does it become like that scab that you just can't stop picking at? Does it become the thing that you can't not pay attention to because you can't have it? Does it stink like rotten meat? Does it become disgusting? Does it become something that you don't want anymore because you are told that you can't have it? Or does it become even more desirable? Does it become even more sweet because you can't have it? Maybe it's a burden. Maybe it's just one more thing on your back, knowing that no matter how hard you struggle, you will never achieve the American dream. Or does it make you so angry that you are being told constantly that you cannot achieve the American dream that you explode, that you turn to violence as a method of achieving that dream? These are some profound questions. And 
in various cases for various individuals, they all had these different reactions when it came to the American dream and the ideals of success and equality that they felt might never come for them. One of the more lasting elements of African Americans in the Harlem Renaissance is going to be their music. The two types of music that are going to become popular at this time are jazz and blues. Now, blues music eventually is going to develop from the Negro spirituals, those Christian songs, those church songs that were developed by African Americans um, in the South that combined Christian music and Christian storylines um, and Christian values with the traditional music styles, especially call and response styles that came from their African homelands. The call and response is a huge part of the blues that you have, um, in some cases, the singer sing a line expecting the um, either other musicians or the audience to actually sing it back. Or they can also repeat the lines a lot. Um, the first line and the second line would be the exact same. Then you'd have a rhyming third line, and then you'd have a rhyming fourth line. And that's kind of the blues right there. It's really a, um, a repetitive form of music, but what made it exciting and what made it interesting was what the words were all about. The blues talks about all the taboo subjects, all the things that you're not supposed to talk about. Um, and we'll, we'll see an example of this in just a moment. But all of the things that were seen as taboo in mainstream society are definitely going to be addressed, though maybe not always very directly, but will be addressed in the music of the blues. The other type of music is going to be jazz. This originates in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, it is a combination of blues, ragtime music, as well as popular music of the 19-teens and 1920s. Um, Ragtime is actually music that you guys are familiar with. So you just may not realize it. Um, you guys are probably familiar with the most famous ragtime song, which is The Entertainer. Um, you hear the you know ice cream man playing it all the time. Um, so that's ragtime, and it was a little bit more of an exciting um, uh, piano style that was popular in the turn of the century, the 1900s. Um, so you combine that with um, the, the, the style of the blues and then kind of the popular music of the time, and you got jazz. Originally, it was known as Dixieland jazz because it originated in the South, and the South was known as Dixie. Um, how it's different from the blues is that where the blues is incredibly structured, you have line A, repeated line A, rhyming B, rhyming C, this is now going to be a lot of improvisation. You're going to have a basic melody, but the musicians are going to Im improvise around it. It's showing their talent. It's showing their musicality. And that was one of the things that made it so exciting. Plus, blues is generally slow. It's generally... It's a lament most of the time. It's, it's sad. It's, you know, my baby left me. My man left me. My, you know, wife left me. It's always these sad kind of songs. But jazz is the exact opposite. It's lively. It's exciting. And even when you have a slow song, it's not as depressing as blues can be. And because of that liveliness, it prompts a new style of dance that is also incredibly lively and uplifting, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. As I said, the blues are a type of music that talks about taboo subjects, the things that we're not polite to talk about. And the greatest blues singer of the age was Bessie Smith with her most famous song, Empty Bed Blues. And I can't sing like Bessie Smith, but it goes a little something like this. 
I woke up this morning with an awful aching head. I woke up this morning with an awful aching head. My new man had left me just a room and an empty bed. Bought me a coffee grinder that's the best one that I could find. Bought me a coffee grinder that's the best one that I could find. Oh, he could grind my coffee cause he had a brand new grind. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, what she's talking about there is exactly what you think she's talking about. So let's go through this line by line. I woke up this morning with an awful aching head. Hmm, how does she get an awful aching head? She has a hangover. How do you get a hangover? By drinking illegal alcohol. I woke up this morning with an awful aching head. My new man had left me, meaning there at one time had been an old man. So this isn't her first rodeo. Just a room and an empty bed. So this was a one night stand. These are not the things that you are supposed to talk about in polite society. These are not things that young people are supposed to be promoting. And yet, that's what was happening. That was what was going on. And the blues was merely illustrating the behaviors that people already had. You guys are probably more familiar with the most famous jazz artist of the time, and that is Louis Armstrong, sometimes referred to as Satchmo. Louis Armstrong starts off in um, a band known as the King Creole Dixieland Jazz Band. And um, King Creole was the lead of that band. He was the piano player, and he was the one everyone came to see. Um, Louis Armstrong was just this young coronet player. He played uh, basically like a trumpet. And um, he was kind of the no-name. But very quickly, he starts to become the one people come to see because of how well he played the coronet. And then later on, when he would begin to sing along with the music that they were playing, his voice was so authentic. And although it wasn't pretty, it was, it was realistic and it felt um, earthy in a lot of ways and people really responded to it. And you guys definitely recognize his music. Um, you guys know him as um, the singer who sings What a Wonderful World. I see trees of green. Okay, I'm not going to do that because that's going to kill my throat. But you can get the idea. It's a very scratchy, husky sound that people responded to because it felt very realistic. And a lot more realistic than the pop music that was coming from the time where they were singing very bubbly music that really had no life and no um, meaning and personality to and jazz music was fun and uplifting, like pop music, but it had more substance. And there was definitely greater musical talent that went into it that people really appreciated. Jazz music is going to become so much part of the music scene at the time that it actually begins to go into classical music. And you see that very evidently in the music of George Gershwin in the song Rhapsody in Blue. For those of you guys who are not musicians, um, right here we have what is known as a trill. This means that you are going to hold a note, but it's going to kind of vacillate. It's going to go do 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 That's a trill. And then it's going to hit a note and glissando, meaning it's going to slide up the scale, and it's going to, what you see here, it is going to get louder as it goes up the scale. So it goes do 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 and then it's going to go whoop. And this opening line right here is one of the most iconic opening notes to any classical song 
ever. And as I said, the liveliness of jazz music is going to create a lively form of dance. And the most popular dance of the time was known as the Charleston. This was a unique style of dance because it did not require a partner. We haven't really had that before. We've always had partner dancing. You've always had to have someone that you danced with. And the Charleston could be danced by yourself or with a partner. And um, they were really very basic steps. Previously, to learn how to dance, many times you had to have professional training. It was um, very intricate dance steps that you had a lot that you had to remember. The Charleston is almost as easy as walking in some ways. It's, it's a dance that virtually anybody could do. And because of that, that's why it becomes so popular as well as that it so well matches the liveliness and the energy and the excitement that comes from jazz music. And this is one of the reasons why women were called flappers is because, as you can see, their arms would flap, their dresses would flap, their legs would flap as they're dancing this dance. And um, it is really just indicative of the youth and vitality uh, overall of the 1920s. So that's the end of our notes for the Jazz Age. I do want to remind you guys that you are going to have your quiz on um, section 7.A, so key period 7.A next class. So I hope that you guys will begin studying for that.